We have two very, very distinguished panelists uh, to talk about this. Uh, Jared Diamond is, is a senior fellow at the Jared Center on... Jared Bernstein. I'm uh, Jared Bernstein, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to dive on that. <laughs> He, I, he means I, you're I think a of you as a diamond is why. <laughs> you're a diamond. Um, now that would be a distinguished speaker. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. I think you're. I think you're. You're. you're for for our you. purposes, you're far more uh, important. So forgive me. Um, uh, Jared Bernstein is a senior fellow uh, at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Um, uh, but and prior to taking on that position, he was a chief economist and economic advisor to Vice President Joe Biden. Um, and uh, he was executive director of the White House Task Force on the Middle Class and really having to deal with just these various sorts of issues that we're talking about here today. And then uh, Vivek Wadwa, who is a star um, uh, on these kinds of issues, um, is Vice President of Academics and Innovation at Singularity University. He also um, is very involved um, at Stanford, at Duke, and at Emory, and is in great demand as a speaker uh, on so many issues, both uh, in the media and in various conferences and so forth. Um, so we heard a very good uh, paper. I think it was very good research. I think we, it, it's added something to the field by, by taking the debate down to the, uh, the metropolitan level uh, and, and what, what, what we need to be looking at, not just nationally, but locally as well on this issue. So I have a number of questions that, that both go um, to the substance of the study and talk a little bit about the politics and policy uh -huh. um, that are recommended at the end of the study. Um, First, uh, does this, I mean, to you guys, um, have they hit on something? Does it really matter? Um, do we, for the economic uh, development and growth of the United States, um, do we really need to um, uh, increase? I mean, we had two years of, a, of lifting the cap. Um, a lot of folks say that we don't really need to lift the cap, that we really need to focus on the training, leave the cap where it is, force force the training through, uh, you know, economic demand internally. Um, and a lot of this is just a lot of smoke and mirrors <laughs> by people in this room, and it's not really important. Uh, and we're, we're, we're missing the point. Um, yeah. You guys, you, you look at it from an economic point of view. You look at it from a, from a, from a training innovation point of view. Why don't you guys give your response to this report? Can I start? Is sure. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I think we are kind of missing the point. Um, uh, and, and so I'm going to take a few minutes, Go just ahead. my intro, and then we'll, we'll do more of a discussion. Um, First of all, let me say, uh, and, and don't count this against my time, because I just want to say that the, uh, I love the Metropolitan Policy Program. Uh, as, as a lot of you do, you get a million emails every day. Whenever I get something from them, I open it and I learn something. And uh, they send a lot of emails. So <laughs> that's a real commitment on my part. Uh, I like uh, Bruce's point about uh, macro to metro, but I tend to think of the Metropolitan Policy Program as sort of the microbiologist of the economy. Uh, and, and no one does a better job of drilling down, and this paper's a good example. That was a paid ad. No, no. That, uh, <laughs> that, uh, in fact, there is no money changing hands, at least as far as uh, I'm concerned today. So if you, right. if you know differently, let no, me know. No, they didn't pay me. I told okay. them I'd have paid you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that's a problem, but we'll deal, we'll deal with that later. Um, okay, so let me, let me uh, make a few comments in introduction. First of all, let me be very clear, because I'm going to be a bit of a skunk at this very lovely garden party. Um, I view immigration as a positive economic force. Uh, there are economists and advocates on the left who don't quite get there, and I, I think they're generally uh, wrong. I think high-skilled immigration is uh, obviously a, a particularly important input in an economy like ours, as, as speakers have said so far today. But so is low-skilled uh, immigration. I, I think we shouldn't forget uh, the importance of that also, um, not just in terms of inputs into the American economy, but in terms of the opportunity and mobility for people who want to come here and improve their lives. But let's not confuse permanent residence immigration with the non-immigrant visas of the H-1B or the L-1 programs or, or any of the non-immigrant visa uh, programs. I think we have to be careful to distinguish between uh, guest worker programs, of which I've always been wary. In fact, and, I, and I'm very much a mend it, don't end it program. This may sound a little more end it than mend it, but that's not where I am. Um, in a sense, I'm amping up my views here because I think they may be somewhat underrepresented, and Brookings is always about balance. So uh, I, I want to be careful to make sure that I add that balance. Um, H-1B, L-1, which I put in a similar category, I think people know what I'm talking about here, uh, looks to me like a particularly inelegant solution to something that I'm not even sure is a problem. Um, inelegant, quote, unquote, because there's no labor market test. 
Uh, I believe it, uh, I think the evidence is that it creates downward wage pressure. Um, these workers, particularly H, well, both, but the H-1Bs are, are linked to their employers in a way that uh, 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 labor former Labor Secretary Ray Marshall has called uh, indentured servitude. And there's uh, also some offshoring uh, 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 concerns here. Um, I'm not as convinced. Uh, well, I'll say more about the offshore. So um, that, that's the inelegant part. What about this not, not sure it's even a problem? Like the H-1B is kind of scratching an itch that isn't even there, which is kind of implicit in, in your question. Um, and no one does, what I have not seen, including in this fine paper, um, is rigorous labor shortage analysis, real identification of a demand shortfall. Do not confuse H-1B demand with labor demand. They're not the same thing. Uh, you can have um, lots of uh, uh, employers seeking these LCAs, the H-1B applications, uh, in a climate with very high unemployment, even among um, uh, skilled workers uh, in the relevant occupations. Um, now, the paper, it's the first regional analysis I've seen of that, and that in and of itself is an invaluable contribution. I'd urge them to keep going, and I'm going to suggest some directions in a second. Um, I thought the part about upgrading uh, worker skills is particularly important. Um, I also want to call attention to the magnitudes of the dollars involved here. That one billion, as far as I understand it, that's over like 10 years. <laughs> and there was 357 million with an M over 10 years uh, for STEM training. That's peanuts, given what we're, we're talking about here. So I'm not, I'm not uh, probably you, you wouldn't disagree with me, uh, but uh, you know, sometimes you have to focus on the magnitude. People hear billion and they think you know, that's a lot. In this case, uh, it, it, it may well not be. Um, OK, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through. Uh, I'm just going to tick off some concerns here. Um, I commend you to the work of Ron Hira. Daniel Costa is a co-author who's here today uh, who has raised many of these concerns. Uh, problems or flaws with the H-1B program. There is no labor market test. Uh, all it takes is an employer attest uh, attestation. They don't have to do the labor certification that you do with, a, with an actual immigrant visa if you want someone to come over here for a job. Uh, so th there needs to be a labor market test. Below market wages are a real concern here. Um, I, I ran into a, a, it's actually in, in a piece Dan Costa wrote, there was a quote from a, a renowned economist who said, there is no doubt that the H-1B program is a benefit to their employers, enabling them to get workers at a lower wage, and to that extent, it is a subsidy. And the radical left-wing nut who said that is named Milton Friedman. <laughs> uh, um, I have, some, I have some details on some of these in, in, in the discussion later, but in the, in, in, when I want to get to that wild, so let me, let me be quick here. Um, I mentioned that the visas are held by the employer rather than the worker. I see this as deeply problematic. Uh, uh, when, when, when an H-1 or an L-1 worker's legal status is dependent on the employer, there is, the, the, it, it's ripe for uh, uh, exploitation, poor working conditions, and these folks have little recourse uh, if they... Uh, in, in too many cases, if they decide they don't like that condition, well, they can just go home. And I mentioned Ray Marshall's quip that that sounded like indentured servitude to him. I think that's way too harsh, but I think that uh, uh, the linkage uh, to the employer is something that uh, could be and should be fixed. And in fact, in the Durbin-Grassley uh, um, uh, legislation that I think would repair many of the flaws I'm mentioning, it is, it is fixed. Um, Look, on the offshoring piece, we'll probably get into offshoring. I won't say much about it now. There is some linkage, more correlation than causation, between the you know, sort of body shop approach to H-1B uh, uh, recruiting and, and versus the employers themselves. So when you're talking about a Tata or uh, uh, you know, the Infosys of the world, the folks who are um, uh, applying for lots of H-1B and, and, and they themselves are, are, are uh, uh, outsourcers, I think that the, the, there's been some linkages made between that and then offshoring back to the home country, and I think that that is a matter of concern. I am very much, I am perfectly comfortable with offshoring. It's a global world and offshoring happens, but I certainly don't want to incentivize any, any more of it. That's one of the reasons why I'm critical of, of uh, Mitt Romney's territoriality plan, by the way. Um, okay, one, well, one last uh, point here. Um, and it's, 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 it's an important one. I was actually struck in the presentation um, <clears throat> uh, by this point that the US must match supply and demand. 
that the U.S. must match supply and demand through government intervention. You didn't say those words, but that was implicit. That the U.S. must match supply and demand through ratcheting up H-1B, which I view as, okay, I'm going to be a tea partier here. I don't usually get to be a, you know, a, a dyed-in-the-wool classical economist here. That, that's, too much, that's too much government intervention for me. I don't see why the labor market shouldn't be the mechanism that matches supply and demand. And if every time there's a labor shortage, and by the way, I haven't seen uh, any establishment of labor shortages in any of this research, if every time there's a labor uh, shortage, a real one, um, you rush to stamp it out by um, increasing the supply uh, of those workers, then the market can never adjust. Markets actually should adjust. Wages should go up. It's a horrifying thought. Wages could go up for somebody somewhere. But wages should go up. Wages should adjust upward when there is a demand a shortage. You shouldn't, we shouldn't rush to increase the supply of guest workers in particular to offset uh, 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 those, yeah, those conditions. Time, your time's up. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, the reason why I'm cutting him off is because uh, when I started my academic career, I was saying exactly the same things he's saying. I was saying there are no shortages. H-1B visa should be abolished. Well, I didn't say there's none. I'd say we I need understand, to show but, that. But there. I went to the extreme, and I, and, and I, I became a hero for the anti-immigrant groups. And then I started researching it further and further and trying to figure out what exactly is going on here. I took on Bill Gates on one occasion, challenging him on this whole issue of, hey, there are no shortages. You're just exploiting American workers and so on. I was a hero with these uh, two or three academics who live in the Ivory Towers and you know, repeat the same things over and over again about H-1Bs are bad, H-1Bs are bad, H-1Bs are bad. This is exactly as, as the camp I was in. Until I started researching it much, much further and realizing that it's a lot more nuanced than meets the eye. That I started interviewing these dozens of people uh, who uh, you know, go on online and post nasty comments on, on the comment boards and you know, who are harassing Neil and his team over here. It's, <laughs> What you find is that they're typically middle-aged workers whose skills are out of date. I hate to say that, but that's the harsh reality of it. And I know I'm going to get some nasty death threats for saying this again in public, but when you start looking at their resumes and interviewing them, you'll realize that they really are out of date, out of touch. They live in the wrong region of the country where the jobs aren't. And when they go for interviews, they don't impress the employers. Therefore, they don't get the jobs. I started spending time with the, so I alienated uh, a lot of people in the corporate world because I came from the corporate world. I came from the tech world. I'd been a tech CEO. I founded companies, and I was friends with some of the most senior execs in these tech companies. I started looking at the other side of it, and then I moved to Silicon Valley. And what I saw was a completely different universe, that in this universe, it's not about money. The cost of labor is not the issue over here. It's about competitiveness. It's about speed to market. It's about getting the best and the brightest. You know, we have Cummings here, for example. Cummings is, uh, is, is taking fire for hiring all these foreign workers. But look at uh, the income of Cummings. It's now 60% global. In other words, they're only getting 40% of the revenue from the United States. To have senators and congressmen and, and uh, you know, the fringe demand that Cummings hires 100% American workers doesn't make sense. The company will be out of business. They won't understand what's happening globally. They won't be able to get the best and brightest. The data Neil showed, uh, a chart he showed up there, had 4% of the engineers uh, at the BA level in the United States, 4%. So in other words, if we protect the jobs at that 4%, we close ourselves off to 96%. Aren't we better off getting the top 1% from all over the world and getting them to come here and compete in America rather than having this closed-minded obsession with protecting jobs? The way America has become what it has is by being competitive, by getting the people who are over here to compete with the best in the world. And guess what? Americans got smarter. They became more astute. Yes, sadly, there was some unemployment as a result of that. But that is a casualty of capitalism. Capitalism stinks as an economic system because it creates rich and poor, and it causes people at the bottom uh, to be left out. But you know, this is why America is the only leading economy in the world, because it knows how to compete. That's what competitiveness is all about. So now we can you know, close our minds and say that, look, we want to protect these unemployed workers who are, you know, whose skills are out of date. Or we can say that we want to continue to compete and make the pie bigger for everyone. That we want to make, by having more competitive companies, by having more Googles and Microsofts and Intels, what we end up doing is creating jobs in an entire ecosystem for the skilled and for the unskilled. We end up uh, boosting the economy and making America more competitive. So we can decide that we want to comp uh, you know, protect a few thousand jobs in America. Maybe, maybe it's 100,000 jobs in America I'm talking about versus the, the uh, tens of millions of other jobs that we might create 
if we start opening up. Now let's get to this report. What the value? Of, so I've been fighting these battles. I switched sides, and I became an enemy of these uh, anti-immigrant groups. I mean, they kept saying what they were saying, and I kept talking about all the you know things I'm learning. And on this H-1B issue, what this uh, uh, report that uh, Neil and his team did shed a very important light. It proved that the the the, the, the problem isn't. A national problem. It's not, not that you can say that there are shortages or they're not shortages. You need more H-1Bs. You don't need H-1Bs. It depends on region. If you look at the data, what it shows you is that the regions which are the most competitive, where all the action is happening, New York is rising rapidly as a tech center right now. You've got to go there and see how, much, how it's booming, how, uh, how much innovation is coming out of New York now for the first time. Well, guess what? New York is also the area which demands H-1Bs the most. So the next in the list, if you count uh, San Francisco and San Jose together, is Silicon Valley. Well, no surprise on that. L.A. L.A. has a defense industry. Uh, you know, there's, there, there, in that region, there's a lot happening there. It needs H-1Bs. So if you start correlating the data that uh, uh, Brookings produced along with innovation and growth, you'll find that there's a pretty strong correlation. And what does that tell you? It tells you that when you have innovation and when you have uh, entrepreneurship, when you're creating jobs, you need more talent. And if the American uh, workforce doesn't have the skill, you bring it from abroad. Even if the American workforce does have the skill, I would argue you want to bring it from abroad because you want it competing. The same way in, in sports, in the NFL, we recruit from everywhere. Okay? We find the best we can get from everywhere. That's what we want to do in tech because tech is a competitive world. It's not this closed, isolated world where you protect workers and you obsess with numbers and you have government dictate policy. <laughs> well, I think uh, you guys have launched so many big issues right here. I think I'll just let Jared. I, <laughs> yeah, you should no, respond. I, to we that. could better for the next <laughs> uh, Look, with with respect. <laughs> oh, we don't have. Wasn't was I respect? <laughs> Wait a minute, I was respectful also. <laughs> I, I, and, and I want to match your respect and even, even see you and raise you in the respect <laughs> category. You're uh, wonderful, my friend. Because you've, you, you've, you've seen a lot on the ground, and I, you know, more than I have. Uh, but I think what you, a lot of what you just said lacked precisely the nuance that I thought you were going to go for. Um, so, for example, I don't know if you were char characterizing my position or somebody else's position, but I was, I was very clear uh, that I'm very supportive of immigration for many of the same reasons that you mentioned. What I didn't hear in your presentation, or sh I should say what I heard in your presentation, is this conflation of immigration and guest worker programs. They're not the same things. And what I find worrisome are the guest worker programs with the flaws in, in H-1B. One. Two. Um, the, uh, there, there was not a shred, uh, there was not a shred of, it was all anecdote. What we really need here is some evidence, and that's what I associate with Brookings, and that's particularly what I associate with the Metropolitan Policy Program. And this is where I wanted to push you on your paper. You now have uh, the only known database <laughs> of, uh, that I know of anyway, of, of, of the LCAs at this, of this metropolitan level. Start linking it up with measures of actual labor shortages and labor demand. Um, if you want to look at the work of Michael, well, anyway, I can, I can show you some very good work if you're not familiar with it on, on how you measure that. But it has to do with unemployment rates, replacement demand, wage trends. On the wage side, I simply don't see the, uh, uh, the labor shortages show up. And, Eric, and that's come, where come, to, to come to Silicon Valley. It's very easy to sit in your ivory towers and have these discussions, okay? Come to Silicon Valley. Look at the, you know, the way Google and Microsoft and uh, Facebook are out gunning each other out, competing for talent. I mean, they're offering million dollar bonuses right now. The salaries are rising, shooting through the roof in Silicon Valley. Same thing in New York City. Look at the salaries, the data is there, you just have to look for it. So you I, have to I, look, but the thing is you have to look for it at the regional level, not at the national level. Look region by region and you'll find the answer. Again. And the other thing is I actually agree with you on, on uh, a key point about how bad H-1Bs are and how temporary worker programs suck. Okay. You know, they're awful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the wrong solution. Because what it does is it creates the entire wage problem you're talking about. Exactly. What happens is that right now, if you're one of my students at Duke Downward from the Masters of Engineering Management program, you graduate from one of the finest programs in, in, in the world, okay? You want to get a job, you happen to be Indian or you happen to be Chinese. Guess what? Your wait time is in the decades. 
So these kids graduating now, first of all, they have a hard time getting jobs because you have these anti-immigrants saying H-1Bs are evil, H-1Bs are evil, anyone that hires them is evil, you can't, hire, you can't hire them so they don't get jobs. When they do get jobs, then they're stuck in the same job for decades. So you start off as a computer programmer, let's say you become a systems analyst or a project manager, you have to go back to the end of the line and start your entire process again. So you go back again decades, so guess what happens? Uh, if you're any uh, employer, you uh, focus on the people who are more likely to leave. You give them the biggest salary increases because you're worried that Google will snatch them away. If you're now 10 years into your visa process, you're working for the same company in the same job, the employer is, is happy, okay? But you're screwed, basically. You're stuck. You can't go anywhere. So, uh, so you're taking advantage of Your salary is lower than what it right. should be. Exactly. And you're stuck in the same old job. And the worst part of it, is, which is what really uh, concerns me, is you can't start a company. Because I've documented that 52% of the startups in Silicon Valley from 95 to 2005 were founded by immigrants, by, by people like me. Okay? People like me came here and typically 13 years after arriving, they started companies which boosted competitiveness. They employed more workers uh, than uh, the number brought in. They made the pie bigger for everyone. They made America what it is. However, because of this backlog that you will agree, uh, there are million skilled immigrants right now as, as of 2007, waiting for green cards. So the number is slightly high let right let now. Jump in. So, so for, uh, I'm glad we agree on those points. And, and, and we, we might agree that um, there are fixes, uh, ways to improve uh, the uh, guest worker programs. Uh, as I started, men don't end. And again, I think Durbin Grassley is helpful in, the, in that regard. You might want to think about including some of that in your future work. But the idea would be to have a real labor market test and to have uh, uh, some mechanism to avoid this downward pressure on wages. So, for example, the real market test is uh, is corporations. They will not uh, hire anyone that's not right for them. Let them hire who they want. Why? Why do we have to tell companies who they can hire? This is not uh, communist Russia or Cuba. We're talking well, about okay. this is America. You can let companies hire anyone that okay. they need. So I think you and let them pay market wages. If if you work for company A, you're not getting paid enough. You can move to company B. You'll do well, that. Okay. Therefore, so company A will pay you stop, stop your market wait. value. I I I. I think, first of all, moving from company A to company B is a good idea. And right. I agree with you. And that means you have to break the linkage with the employer who controls your visa. Agreed. Let's fix that. Oh, let's fix that. Yeah. So, but then secondly, <laughs> there, there, there's a thing that we inherently disagree on. And I think, of, I, I think you either are somewhat misunderstanding the, uh, the, the actual uh, policy or the law itself. Look, you are not supposed to hire... Uh, an H-1B worker if there is uh, an available uh, uh, American worker to uh, uh, do that job. Now, in, it, it's often very... So can, it be, me, can, it, can it be any worker? Uh, I mean, an no, it has, or, has yeah. to, it has to be uh, appropriately skilled. But, so, but that's where the problem is, that skill, what tech companies need is people with the best skills, who can write, right. the, know the latest technologies, who are, you know, the difference between an average programmer and a great programmer is often three to nine times in productivity. Okay? So let me just finish They my want point. those super programmers. I understand. Why, so you're going to force them to hire an average programmer just because there's someone in the country who happens to have that skill? I, Does no, that I, make sense? Is that America? I, I, I think uh, there need Look, you're, right. the, the, if the attestation doesn't work, which is... This is the law. I mean, you may want to change the law, but this is the law. The law says that you have to at least say you've tried. Now, you don't have to really try. You have to say you tried. But, but you do try. If you can, if you can hire an American, companies would rather not spend the legal fees. It's starting to oh, feel sorry, like cable maybe, television. Yeah. <laughs> let, let, let me make this. I'm on right. CNBC. I'll be, quiet. I'll be quiet. Thank you. Let me just finish. So, so and, and you will have ample time to respond. Uh, and, and our poor moderator is getting... Sh uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should bring you back in here. Great job. I don't have to do anything. So, so... The, the spirit, as well as the letter of the law, is not as you're characterizing it. What you're basically saying, you'll have a chance to rebut this. What you're basically saying is, look, employers should be able to hire whomever they want to meet uh, the uh, skill demands of that job. And if, 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 if that means bringing somebody from abroad, uh, they should do so. Exactly. That's not, right. Yeah, that's that's not H-1B. That is simply not H-1B. H-1B says, if you can't find that worker here, then you can bring that worker from abroad. The problem is there is not a, 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 a standard, a, a work uh, a, a, a test uh, to establish that. And I think there should be. That's all. Well, I think, uh, if, if, I, if I might say, I think so many studies say it's probably impossible to develop a, a good standard, particularly one that's timely. Labor certification. And I really thought that's where you were leading with your first discussions when you were saying that, that um, 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 
you know, the, we we don't the, you know quoting Ray Marshall when we right. don't we don't have this thing, but I know we have a representative here from the from the Chamber of Commerce. I see that the uh, that the study recommends having some sort of an independent that's a good idea uh, commission to be able to set what the levels should be and so forth, uh, and yet the great fear of an independent commission is precisely where I thought you were going, which is it may be un-American. It's sort of like a smacks of a central planning. This is can, Cuba can, we're can, about. can a commission really <laughs> set a, a measure demand? Is it always going to be a year or two behind the curve? Should you not let the market decide what it should be? And so there have been a few proposals to come back and try and bridge the differences between you. And the latest was, in fact, presented here at Brookings uh, through the Hamilton Project, uh, which is a study the by auction. Giovanni Perry about going to an auction system. And say Gary Becker has come, that other people. The economists all love auctions as a <laughs> form of being able to, to decide these kinds of things. Um, what about that? Why don't you go ahead? I think that would be a great idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Let the market decide. You see, if the market decides, then you can't really take the position that, that, that Neil espoused, which is, and I quote, uh, U.S. must match supply and demand implicitly through ratcheting up uh, uh, H-1B applications. That's not a market solution. That's a government solution. So I'm all for letting the market decide, but let's not artificially tweak supply to get there. You know, I think California should be able to allow to set its own uh, immigration policy, frankly. <laughs> because, you know, take, you know, take California as an example, okay? You know Silicon say. Valley desperately needs talent. They're not worried about bringing too many people in who are going to become unemployed. They're worried about increasing their tax base, increasing the, you know, getting the, the, the state back to health. What's uh, the government doing? It's allowing farmers in Iowa, I mean, Senator Grassley, to dictate how many workers can work in Silicon Valley. I mean, Silicon Valley doesn't tell, uh, you know, Iowa how to plant its seeds or, you know, what crops they should grow, okay? Why should they be telling Silicon Valley how many skilled workers they can have and from where? What technologies they should have? Who they should hire? Why should you have regions that don't have any requirements for skilled labor dictating to high, uh, you know, regions with high demand what uh, they should be doing? We have a conceptual difference here, and I think it, you, you both presented very great um, 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 uh, arguments uh, for these. For, and everybody has to decide for themselves which side they want, want what, which side they want to take on this issue, and it'll be a, it'll be a major policy debate. Let's take the flip side of it then. About why don't we have the, those Americans uh, who are performing at this uh, uh, this much higher level? Um, uh, why aren't they available? And uh, uh, and this and this I noticed in the report, and I pick up a little bit on, on your point, Jared. Uh, that when we look at the amount of money that these fees are generating and we look at, at what's being done with that money, I mean, I thought it was appalling when, when, when actually the amount of scholarships for Americans to study STEM funded by this program amount to 5000 a year. <laughs> what's that? Nothing. So um, what should be done? I mean, the, the program, even the training that goes on is for technicians, not for PhDs. What we should do uh, so is spend the money where So what should we be needed. doing? Should we rethink yeah. our, our uh, uh, education? I mean, how, you know, who's going to be hiring those technicians? Should we rethink our whole STEM education, and should the money be done, spent in a different way? The money should be spent will have the most impact. Right now, the shortages are in the metro areas, yet we're spending money in other areas. We're skill, skilling up labor in areas where it's not needed. Right. Isn't that brain dead? Right. Why not spend it where it's needed? This is the point that the report makes. That's one of the, right. that's one of the points the report right. makes. But right. the second report is, that's the geographic point. The second point is, should you be putting it into technicians or should you be putting it into the people who hire Let the technicians? Let the market decide. So I would offer, they have money for training. Now we're talking about I this education. Offer, I would offer companies money for training. Let them spend it on bringing in new workers uh, and spending it on those workers. I don't. Why should government get involved with what, things that you're, tr you're trying to say on. the government should give up the, the oh. whole education system? Let it be, <laughs> let it be scholarships. And let people go and study what well, they want, the, the, where the job so I, 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 This is where we're going. So I, I, I pretty strongly disagree with the notion that you'd want to give this to companies or sort of let them mark. I, I think we actually have a market failure. And I think that that's partly what you're describing. Uh, the idea that uh, our educational system doesn't seem to be generating uh, an adequate supply of, of workers uh, with these uh, uh, particular skills. However, and again, this is an assignment for the Metropolitan Group, uh, as well as uh, other scholars here at Brookings, it's not as clear to me as it is to you. And, I, and look, I get it that you might see this at the ground level, at the anecdotal level. I'm not at all disparaging that, not in the slightest. I re very deeply respect what you see on the ground. But the plural of anecdote is data. And it really does have to show up in what you keep disparagingly calling the ivory tower statistics. It really does have to show up there. And I don't think that we have great evidence 
of a uh, shortage of supply of STEM workers. In fact, there was a front page article the other day about um, uh, uh, quite high unemployment rates among uh, 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 certain workers. I think it was in, in the STEM field, but more, more related to biology than, than um, IT. And so one, the first thing we should do is actually learn more about uh, the depth of the problem. But that said, um, it, it does, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure that you could really lay, I'm not sure that you know, the H-1B fee program is the way to get from here to there. I think what's more worrisome in this regard is the extent to which we're, we're um, deeply cutting what's called the non-defense discretionary part of the federal budget, which is the part of the budget that actually pays for education and training. I think this Neil's the next report. You should look at it. Uh, I mean, just look at the job ads in Silicon Valley. Count them up, and he'll have the data that he wants. It's quite well, simple. You're doing this wonderful work with Singularity University. Right. What could we be doing for our education system that, that feeds into this whole issue? Well, what's happening, you know, my uh, uh, article yesterday in Foreign Policy was, the title of it was, Why the jobs, uh, Manufacturing Jobs Are Going to Be in America, Not in China. Because if you look at the way technology is advancing, it's fa much, much faster than anyone can imagine. The new types of jobs are going to be much different than the old types of jobs are. Sadly, our policymakers are, are mired in, in, you know, in data from 20 years ago. They don't understand how fast you're things not, are changing. You're not supposed to point at Jared when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that there's a lot happening. We should skill Americans up on the you know, technology of the future and, and spend more on workforce training. I'm very much for, for now teaching them about the later, giving them the later skills and making them more competitive. That's what we should be putting our focus on. I have on. a great anecdote for you. You'll like this. Uh, no, you, you, your data. Now, I'm now, now you're switching to the anecdote. I'm switching. <laughs> to, yeah, I got to switch to anecdotes. I'll have to start giving data out. Yeah, because yeah, I'm not getting enough love for my data here, so let me switch to, <laughs> to anecdote. I, I, I worked for the Labor Department in the, in the, in the mid-'90s. I was uh, the chief economist office in the Labor Department. And um, this is when the folks from Silicon Valley uh, came in. Uh, some of whom may well be in this room, uh, and, and, and said, um, we need to raise the cap on H-1Bs. And we economists sat around and listened to them. And all, after a few minutes, it became clear what they were saying is, for the first time in our history, uh, we're seeing upward pressure on wages. Uh, we're, we're seeing wages go up. We have to now bid wages up. This was the 90s, when every mid, you know, mid 90s, everybody had to bid wages up to get and keep the work, workers. That we have to bid wages. We're actually facing higher labor costs. And we're coming to the government for relief. And to me, you know, that was it, it precisely the market signal that you'd want to incentivize uh, more kids to stop going to finance and getting into, you know, smart kids to stop going into finance and get into IT. These market signals, these price signals are critically important, not just from an academic sense, but from the functioning of, of, of a well-functioning a, a well economy. And the idea that you'd want to, you know, take a fire hose out and essentially put out that market signal by um, uh, I I increasing caps in, in a guest worker program strikes me as quite wrongheaded. You know what, uh, give, me, give me an, another anecdote, uh, an analogy to what you're talking about. That would be like California saying that, look, we're only going to admit students from California in our universities because, other in they, because, we, they have, because our students have to compete, therefore we have to equip them better. What would happen? You'd have state after state get weaker and weaker. You want competition. So you American, want, you'd like Americans, open borders, right? Not, not open borders, not totally open borders. But you should allow companies to hire the talent that they need from wherever they need it. Why should we be communist over here? Why should we be now looking no, it, backwards 50 years? It, it is not uh, communist it to is, control labor. It is. I, it, 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 that's <laughs> okay. what you're that advocating. Is, that's a pretty uh, radical view. I just <laughs> want to tell you. I'm not saying it's wrong. I think it's wrong. I'm but saying it's radical. <laughs> let America compete. We're in trouble. We need to get out of this mess. It's not communist. There are amazing people all over the world who can come here and start companies Bruce, and boost this economy. Help me out here. <laughs> it, it is not communist to control <laughs> your labor flows. Right. Um, um, picking up on that point, right. um, uh, more and more economists are beginning to question the effects of globalization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and been looking mostly at it on the, the monetary flow side. Someone on the trade side, you're taking it an hour to the, to the tech labor side. Um, is it possible with what you're proposing that all we are doing is opening up a race to the bottom? No, uh, and, not, that, no. and that for the United States, for the United States as a nation, you say the United States can compete. One of these United States, this thing called the United States compete, and the other thing are all these 300 some odd million Americans being able to compete in this world. Um, is it the race to the bottom that you're suddenly 
they're competing one to one uh, with with Indians um, at a much lower wage level, and at some day we're all going to benefit. Yes, the, the, all the economists will all tell you that at some day we'll all you know the world productivity will go up, everybody's richer. But from here to there, huge costs. Should it not be more managed like the original right. Bretton Woods system, post World War II system, let working me, our let, way there in a more gradual? Let way. me give you two answers. Number one, this is the same debate that's existed in America since the beginning of yes. of uh, the uh, of, of time. You know, when, um, w w you've had wave after wave immigrants coming here, with the previous wave saying, "Hey, these new ones are taking our jobs away. If we bring too many of them away, we will become less competitive. We'll we'll have more poverty here, and so on." The exact opposite happened. The second thing is I'm now advocating skilled immigrants. I'm now talking about bringing in people who are the best in their fields from all over the world to come here and to work for our companies, make them more competitive, because our companies are mostly shipping their goods abroad. Mm -hmm. The majority of the, uh, the revenue that our biggest companies get is from abroad. It makes them stronger. It makes them richer. It makes America richer. And I'm talking about limited skilled immigration here of the best and the brightest. And the other thing I want is, is for anyone who wants to start a company here to be able to get a visa to start a company here. And if, they create, if they've created a few jobs after a few years, give them a green card. They've proven themselves. So yeah. I think that globalization is, A, a force uh, for good, B, here to stay, part of our reality of, of, of advanced and even emerging economies, and C, has true costs and benefits. The problem with the discussion too often is that it's only discussed as a benefit, and the costs, you, be, you become, uh, uh, again, sort of a skunk at the garden party if you, if you raise costs. I think that's less the case now because it's much more conventional uh, wisdom among economists that the cost side matters too. Even um, you know, stalwarts like uh, uh, Paul Samuelson have written articles about some of the, uh, the costs to uh, workers in advanced economies who are hurt by global competition. So that's very real. Um, and I think we have to be mindful of that when we discuss uh, this issue. I think in terms of high-skill immigration, it actually uh, makes a lot of sense. And in many ways, um, you know, if you, uh, a very liberal economist, Dean Baker, has argued that uh, you should really ratchet up high-skilled immigration uh, because that would put some of the downward pressure on these um, uh, skill premiums that have been one of the factors driving inequality. It would, you know, in his view, it would actually make physician services cheaper, for example, if we um, ratcheted up the supply of of doctors from abroad, but by the way, you know the AMA might have something to say about that, and licensing uh, uh, um, issues work as a kind of a, uh, uh, a to the disadvantage of that kind of solution. Meanwhile, at the low end, there's you know very aggressive uh, immigration coming uh, over the border. In many cases, uh, uh, um, workers without you know uh, what do you call them. Uh, um, you know, without, without, without credentials, um, you know, not illegal immigration, um, undocumented, and in, in many cases undocumented. So I, I you know, I think at, at the low end of the labor market, we kind of implicitly bless all this undocumented immigration. It's a very sloppy, unsustainable thing. At the high end, we kind of restrict a lot of it uh, in, in, in some uh, cases to protect the, the incomes of, of, of uh, elite occupations of workers. And I, I think th 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 those, are, those are both wrong. Um, and I, I think uh, the, the guest worker program, as it's structured, and I think we kind of agreed on this earlier, exacerbates those problems. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, 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 uh, you, 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 you're touching on, I mean, by bringing in uh, undocumented immigration, you're now touching on the whole issue of, of greater immigration policy and how yeah. the H-1B and skilled workers uh, fit into that. Uh, uh, the conversation we had over breakfast was, you know, why can't we just focus on H-1Bs and skilled workers? It's the you know, best thing for America. If you question about why not, whether or not it may be. Um, um, uh, is it even possible politically to focus only on this issue, whatever the solution is, or do we really have to have some kind of a comprehensive immigration legal, uh, comprehensive immigration reform? Uh, let me report? start, because I have, you know, I, I, worked, I worked for the White House not that long ago, and I can tell you that... Um, it is possible, and um, n not only possible, but probable, and in fact, one of the fewer er areas in, in, in immigration that you actually can uh, talk about. Pretty much everybody agrees that we should have more high-skilled immigration. It is widely agreed upon. Actually, the folks who uh, tend to uh, oppose it in, 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 in various cases tend to be um, those uh, groups with whom high-skilled immigrants would compete, as I mentioned earlier. So I think that it's actually one of these sort of marginal areas that we could, uh, that, that could actually uh, uh, um, uh, have bipartisan agreement. It, it's interesting to me that you've got Durbin on one side and Grassley on the other side. So this is an area where we actually might be able to fix some of the flaws that I've been stressing and, and that we agree on. I mean, I'm saying there should be two or three simple things. Number one, 
increase the number of green cards available. That will fix the entire stress on the H-1B system. The reason why the salary distortion is because people are stuck in limbo. They can't uh, change jobs. They can't start companies. That will be a huge, huge boost. Okay? And then there's this per country uh, limit, the per country cap thing, which is screwing up the entire system. There's a maximum of 7% for many countries that can uh, get green cards. It just doesn't make sense. And then we need a startup visa that anyone who wants to come and start a company here which creates jobs, let them come and start their company. They employ American workers, let them stay. Very simple fixes, and you'll cause a major shift in the economy, and all of this costs zero. I'm not talking about trillion dollar bailouts. I'm not talking about subsidies. I'm not talking about you know, massive government programs. I'm talking about something that costs zero. And both sides will agree on. So I guess the point uh, that I maybe may implicit, I should have made explicit, is what, what I was saying is, I think the kinds of things I was just describing, like Grassley, Dermot, um, are politically possible. I worry that some of the more broad, comprehensive immigration reform, increased green cards, those are much heavier political lifts, much heavier. I'm not saying they're bad ideas, but they are. Uh, it, I was kind of. It, it's plausible that if Congress ever starts working together again, that they could actually work on the kinds of things we're talking about here. And what you're talking about would be good, but that's further down the road politically. I think. I my, I'll repeat what I said uh, at the at the Hamilton thing. I think it's five to ten years down yeah. the road, at least. Well, what's going to happen is that you're going to find uh, tech centers uh, sprawling in India, China, Brazil, all over the world. Google class companies competing with our Google class companies. They're going to wake up and say, "Hey, what happened over here? How did these? Uh, you know, how did our uh, American educated people, American skilled people, go there and build their companies? Why didn't we let them here? We're going to be looking back and wondering why we lost." all these hundreds of thousands of jobs, these you know, uh, trillions of dollars of potential uh, uh, opportunities that could have been in America. That's a sad thing, 10 years from now. Well, uh, picking up on that, uh, going back then to the education issue, one thing is that you educate people um, uh, with these certain skills. The other thing is that they're innovators. Right. You can argue that you know, America still has a sort of a climate and the sort of diversity and all those sorts of things that lead to innovation. Uh, that India and China don't have? The Indian Chinese education system is awful, really bad. But when Indians and Chinese come here, they become fiercely productive. You know, uh, uh, I mean, a seventh of all the startups, 15.5% well, of the startups in Silicon Valley founded by immigrants, yeah. despite 6% of the Silicon Valley no, population th being th Indian. Th that's here. Because, I'm not about competing with, well, with what they started up there. Yeah, but now what, what happened over the last five or seven years is that you had uh, you know, tens of thousands of skilled immigrants who were here, who were educated here, who you know, basically grew up learning the American way, and they were forced to go back because of our brain-dead visa policies. So they started, started forming the companies over there. You're seeing hundreds of startups sprouting in places like uh, you know, Delhi, Bangalore, Shanghai, Beijing, which should have been here. But so, we're in a metropolitan group here. Is there anything that uh, um, cities and metropolitan areas should be considering uh, as they talk about this whole issue, not just to talk about training and education, but also to encourage innovation? So they it's a state from the United States, set up their own visa policies, their own sanctuaries for skilled immigrants. Start your company here, we'll protect you from the feds. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, uh, if, you uh, if you secede from the communist uh, policies of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say communist policy in the United States. I said communist policies that some uh, you know, academics and some uh, nativists are advocating, okay, to well, be precise. I very, just to be clear, I United States is capitalist. disassociate myself from any of those uh, <laughs> Good. comments. Um, I'm actually the advocate of the market solution here. Good. Um, so I think the, the thing, a couple of things on the last yeah. few exchanges. One is that I am, I am less worried than you are about um, innovation either here or, or abroad. Uh, I, I, I continue to see uh, evidence of uh, innovation, uh, particularly in high tech, but also in other important areas, advanced batteries, clean energy. Uh, well, advanced batteries is a subset of clean energy, but uh, uh, you know, uh, solar, geothermal. Um, I, I've seen, yeah, particularly in the clean energy field, lots of interesting innovation breaking out. I'm less worried about that. And I'm also, by the way, uh, I think it's absolutely uh, uh, imperative that some of the emerging economies begin to innovate as well. I don't see that as a threat to us at all. I see that part of the matrix of globalization, and, and God bless them. Um, the, the, their gain is not necessarily our loss. Uh, secondly, what I do see as a problem, 
there's a great, there's a really uh, important statistic. The Kauffman Foundation's done good work on this. Um, uh, actually, interesting. Uh, Bernanke himself was talking about be this. Be careful. Yesterday. You're sitting next to Mr. Kauffman. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. Uh, I, I, you it's guys, funny my research are going to be you, you guys have done. You guys have done good work on this. Um, one of the things that you see is that startups, it's not, it's not that there are fewer, it's not that the pace of startups has diminished. The pace of startups is, has been fairly constant. It's that um, startups haven't, haven't grown very much. They haven't uh, had that kind of burst out gazelle-like employment growth that, that you need to see. It's one of the reasons we've been stuck in this sloggy kind of uh, recovery. Typically, it's the small firms as they grow that lead us out. We haven't seen enough of that. And nobody really knows the answer, but I think it has to do with something called a locative inefficiency. Or I think I made up that term, so let me explain it. But what is it again? A locative inefficiency, <laughs> or you know, inefficient allocation. Oh, okay. I think what we've done over the past 10 years 15 years, is allocated too much of our national resources in, in finance and in financial markets and in financial instrumentation. Innova that's another kind of innovation and not nearly as productive for the economy as the kind we're talking about. And so I think that the venture capital uh, side of the economy has actually um, not uh, uh, been able to uh, support the kind of innovation and growth of our startups that it did, say, in the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And, and that's problematic. Yeah, let me add, uh, um, I agree with part of what you said, but a lot has changed over the last decade. It used to be that the cost of starting a technology company would be millions of dollars. You'd need three to five million in, in venture capital. Today, thirty to $50,000 is, en is enough. You can build innovative medical products. You can build innovative clean tech products. You can build innovative robotics products for small amounts of money, which means that entrepreneurs can do today what only governments and big research labs could do even as recently as a decade ago, which also means that thing. entrepreneurs anywhere in the world can do the same that we can do here today, that they don't, have a has uh, they don't have a handicap anymore. And venture capital has become less important. So it's, it's this new world that we're in which is going to uh, redefine us. So we have to, this is what I'm saying, it's all, it's all about people, it's all about talent. We want every smart person in the world being here on our side, yes, we want India and China and other countries to do well, good for that. But right now, our economy is sick. I mean, we're really in bad shape here. My, my concern is how do you boost this economy over the next three to four years and get things humming again? Well, so I mean, then we can be benevolent and well, say, hey, India and China do now, well. Now, now you're kind of getting into something that's a little bit different, which is our economy's current illness. And believe me, man, that does not have to do with a, an insufficient supply of labor. That's on the demand side. And you know, increasing labor supply in a climate of weak labor demand is just going to make unemployment higher. You need more startups. Yeah. Had, so more startups, if, if you had a startup visa, or let's say that out of the million skilled immigrants, you said anyone who starts a company um, you know, can, can now jump this line and get a green card. You'd get tens of thousands of new startups, which would employ hundreds of thousands of workers. That's a quick zero cost fix. Let me, let me come back to the supply with two supply questions, then we'll open up the questions at 20 of. Um, on the supply side, uh, how do we control, or how, or even to what extent, do you think there are abuses of the H-1B system it's of of of, yeah. of 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 companies, and and I and I think especially of Indian companies. Yeah. We all know they do this, um, um, bringing people in. Um, they could actually find people locally if they really wanted to, but they they want to bring their guys over from India. Uh, I mean, to what extent do we have that there, kind there, of there abuse? Every government program is abused. Medicare is abused. So the tax system is abused. We have corrupt politicians. DC is corrupt. Okay. Does that mean that we now, uh, you, know, you know, cut off Medicare and cut off and systems? There's abuse of any system. So probably 10% of, of these visas are abused by sleazebag Indian companies. That's probably the case. <laughs> but you know something? 90% are not. technical term. 90% are not. You have, you have the good companies, the Infosys, the Wipros, mm. the, the Tatas, which are solid, respectable right. companies. You know, the, the anti-immigrant groups are attacking them left, right, and center, trying to uh, portray them as evil companies. They're not. Okay. You, you, They're very you, ethical companies. Do me, do me right. one favor. Right. Just grant me one thing. Stop calling them anti-immigrant groups. I mean, men, they're and xenophobic anti-immigrant groups, my friend. I've dealt with them. <laughs> I, I get death threats from these people. I mean, by the time we're done with this thing, this is right. going to be all over the, the Nazi websites. Well, Just that, watch. That, 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 you know, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I live this thing. I, you I, haven't received death threats like I have from these wackos. They're, you know, on Twitter, I, on email, you know, just 
I'm hounded by these anti-immigrants for saying what's right for America. Well, first of all, uh, let me just say that it's very important in this audience where we right. don't have too many wackos. Um, uh, you <laughs> well, know who, we don't know yet. You know who you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. When we get to the Q and A, we'll figure out. We don't know uh, yet. <laughs> but uh, it's it's very important, I think, in this audience to recognize that you can be critical of of, of the flaws in guest worker programs and still be adamantly pro-immigrant. I just want to make that no, a very, very, very strong good. point. Um, I think, uh, in answer to your question, uh, I, I do think that uh, the kinds of uh, fixes that um, I've advocated, if you read the work of Ron Hira, he's very good and articulated. He says uh, the same uh, thing over and over uh, again. Uh, the guy is a nutcase academic as far as I'm concerned. Who, who, you who, can who? quote me on that. Who, who? It's, a guy, it's, it's someone who writes. He says about, the same thing over for the last, go, go and read That's his, nothing wrong with saying the, the same thing. I say the same, the same you thing. You say the same thing over and over. No, I don't. Who? Go and read myself. I've evolved, okay? He's still trying to sell his books. There's nothing that's wrong with, all he does is I, try to sell his outsourcing America book. I mean, come on. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being repetitive if your solutions have yet to be embraced. He, he, has, um, he lives so, in Rochester. He's never been to Silicon sh- Valley, as far as I wait, know. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, then. just just wait. This, again, this is not cable. Um, the you know the labor market test. We both agree on the on. on on, on, on uh, uh, setting a higher wage floor. Um, I think uh, we both agree on separating the linkage with the uh, sponsoring employer. I think those fixes are important. Um, but let me just show you something. I saw it, it, this is in the paper from ju- just the other day, July 14th. Um, uh, uh, Tata Consultancy Services, the largest information IT provider, has applied for um, 5,900 H-1B visas for America this year, up from 1,400, uh, uh, up 1,400 from last year's 45 hundred applications, the com- uh, and, and, and they say, quote, the challenge of visa rejection, especially in the L1 category, uh, uh, continues. It's still in the 50% range, so we've changed our focus and opted for H-1B visas. Okay? Now, to me, this is kind of a classic example of what I'm talking about. You have, a, you have, you have Tata Consultancy, Tata uh, TCS, which you know, you're calling you know, one of the good players, and I don't, I don't disagree with you. The very ethical company. Look Re- at the, you know, I you know, don't disagree with you right. relative to some of the others. But there, I guarantee you there is no labor market test going on there. There is a general sense, probably that not on, let me finish. 6, not, let me finish. In a population of 300 million, 6,000 workers is what we're debating over here. Yeah. We're making them the villain. We're saying we have to cut off I'm not, the lifeline of Silicon Valley because Tata brought in 6,000 h one This is silly. It's I mean, not, this is something, look at look. the real numbers over here. 6, 5,900 workers, and we're debating whether they should be allowed to bring in 5,900 workers. They're going to cause unemployment in America. Let's get real over here. Maybe 300 of them were not qualified. What's the big deal over here. Okay, that's smart that's poli- ahead, smart yeah. policy is not made by hand waving and anecdotes and but you're taking just, everything you're, I'm you're, saying. Let, let him, let him, let him taking talk. everything I'm saying, say and and you know a, a, as if I'm sort of like undermining the system and and, and talking, about, com- and talking, talking about. about communism right. and secession. I mean that's not that's just not smart policy. We want smart policy making here. And all I'm saying is that when someone says in an un- in, in an economy with uh, stuck at unemployment north of eight uh, percent, where uh, you know over five million million people have been unemployed for, for uh, at least half a year to say that we are now, A, ratcheting up our, uh, our, our H-1B applications uh, uh, up 1,400, and we're doing so because we're getting rejected on the L1 side, that, that, there's no reference to, to labor shortage. And, and in an economy like ours with such slack demand and such uh, um, and, and, and excess supply, um, I t- to me, that's part of the problem. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, let's stop here. Let's stop here. Uh, Neil uh, and, and Jill, will you come up and join us? Uh, Jill is co-author uh, uh, of this uh, report, and we're going to open it now to questions uh, to any uh, of our panelists. So please raise your, your name, wait for the microphone, uh, and uh, state your name and your organization. Yes, ma'am. Right here in front. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Peggy Orchowski. I'm the congressional correspondent with the Hispanic Outlook on Higher Education and written a book on immigration, called Immigration in the American Dream, Battling the Political Hype and Hysteria, part of which is a lot of the rhetoric that I really wish you wouldn't use anti-immigrant and nativist and all that. That really isn't necessary in a place like this. Um, it seems that the big problem with uh, temporary worker programs is that the jobs we're talking about are temporary 
After all, the idea is that they're replacing Americans who become obsolete. But if you make the temporary worker permanent, they're going to become obsolete too. You're going to constantly need a new working force that is the best and brightest, so-called. But they're really just young people who have got the latest skills. Same way on the bottom level, once you um, legalize the illegal workers who are working in the fields, they're not going to do those jobs. So you're going to need people. So how do you... How do you solve this inhumane, maybe, problem of having people temporary when all jobs are temporary at this point? And um, the, other, the other thing I'm wondering yeah, is about... Yeah, this is the one question so that we can oh, okay. have other people ask questions. Thank you. Um, well, maybe some of our... Just to give our, us a rest, uh, do you guys want to <laughs> tackle that? Um, I'd actually like to address one of Jared's comments, if I could. Absolutely. And okay. then we'll get to your question. Okay. We won't forget. It's a good question. <laughs> Um, first, uh, you mentioned the article about STEM workers being unemployed, and I just wanted to bring up the fact that STEM workers are still better off than others. Their unemployment rates are lower than those yeah. who don't have STEM degrees. They're probably, unemployment rate is probably like around 4% right now, but typically it's around 2 So it, that, that, I think that's even in your paper or yeah. in some similar paper. Um, <laughs> but secondly, I wanted to address your comment about... Um, you know, we said that we need to match skills to demand, and um, you said that we're calling on the US government to be the, the only way to do that. And in fact, what we're saying is that we need to make these decisions based on evidence, including on evidence at the local level. And that's why we're advocating for the Standing Commission that would be able to do those labor shortage analyses that you call for. And maybe you'd like to be on the commission to do that. <laughs> uh, but to, to make these decisions based on evidence, including evidence at the local level. Thank you. Good, good answer. Right, so, good um, and who would like to answer the, okay. uh, the, uh, the audience? Let, let me address that. Um, you know, first of all, I don't like this temporary business at all. But what happens is when you bring permanent workers in, then they buy houses, they start companies, they add to the economy. It's, it's false that uh, uh, you know, one person coming in from abroad takes the job of another uh, who is already here. This is like the same uh, discussion that's happened in America generation after generation. What happens is that when you bring in people who are you know, uh, energetic, who you know, can contribute to the economy, they make the pie bigger for everyone. They create more jobs. This is what immigrants have done. Skilled immigrants have created more jobs than they've taken away. That's what, what I'm advocating. Bring in the, 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 the you know, caliber of people who can contribute and let them here be here permanently. No more of this short-term visa thing. No more H-1Bs. Bring them in on permanent resident visas. Take the chance on them. So uh. your, your, your concern seems to be that if we make temporary permanent, then somehow we'll still have a need for temporary workers. And I, I just don't know if, if, if that's right. I mean, so for example, you mentioned, um, un, you mentioned, say, the seasonal workers, many of whom are, of course, documented on seasonal visas, um, like in, in, you know, working in the fields. And if they, were, if, they, if they had green cards, then they wouldn't do that anymore. You know, I've always been wary of the argument that there are jobs that Americans won't do. I've always been wary of the argument that you give somebody a card and the job that they would do yesterday is a job they won't do today. I think that um, uh, what really matters uh, is the quality of the job, the wage level, the benefit level, the security of the job. And um, if you improve, if, if the quality of those jobs improved, uh, I suspect uh, people would be uh, perfectly happy to stay in them. Um, uh, if, uh, if they were uh, adequately uh, remunerated. I, I mean, that's just sort of basic economics, but I, I think it's true. And I think one of the problems that we both have, maybe all of us have, with the, and, and you uh, as well, with the, with the nature of the guest and the temporary workers, is that those, the, the, those jobs often are exploited with below market wages and, and lousy working conditions. So I don't think we can assume that, that those jobs have to stay uh, as, as, uh, as tough as they are. Uh, I think. I think I just want to clarify a thing that just to remember that the H-1B program is a dual intent program. And when we interviewed about 60, uh, you know, besides the data, we actually interviewed a lot of the companies. And we, we learned that a lot of them use it for different reasons. So the H-1B program is actually not just a temporary guest worker program, but there's a lot of companies on day one already intending them to get a green card. But they know that because of the citizenship it takes, and the backlog, it takes a long time. So I think that the problem, what we are exposing, I mean, for the first time, again, looking at the local level, the data only allows us to look at the demand at, at, at the broadest level. But what it does expose is that it's, the H-1B program is dealing with a lot of different types of visas, 
all in one, like different types of uses. So I think, just wanted to clarify that because I know Good. that's been heated here, but. Yeah. We had a question here. Thank can, you. Can you please stand? Okay. I'm Sonia Plaza from the World Bank, working on migration and remittance issues. I wanted to congratulate Neil, who was a former colleague working with us. I have a, um, when I want to disagree with you that a lot of the immigrants going back to India, China, and Brazil has been because they couldn't get a permanent residence. China has embarked on a huge innovation program with a lot of money. I, I agree with that. India yeah. on that also. And then Brazil is growing. But I wanted to, to get more on your views because the innovation policy system, the innovation system in the United States, I don't think that is working well. Okay. And I would like to know exactly, because you were posting the questions on the education policy and the training, but you have been come out very clearly. First, because a lot of the PhD students in science here from the United States also go to other countries because they cannot find a job here, the payment is very low, especially in the science. Everybody's going to Europe or to other things, they're losing the competitiveness. And if you go to the NIH, you see that. I wanted to know why no more American students are entering into, this, uh, into these areas. And second, what do you propose in terms of the firms? I agree with you, it has to be free, open competition, get the best. But at the same time, there has to be mobility of talent. I haven't seen any, any, any discussion on mutual recognition of skills for developing countries. You can get a job here if you have been educated here, but there are very good people graduating in other countries. I haven't seen that discussion. And second, I wanted to hear your views because I work in developing countries. And I always hear it says, don't even try to propose that people move freely, skill people, because there's brain drain. We have to retain the best people in their countries. So I wanted your views. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the answers she requires would take me two hours to cover. Best thing, <laughs> go to my website, wadwa.com, W-A-D-H-W-A.com. I write for a lot of publications about all this. I've published a lot of stuff on it. You'll find most of the answers you're looking for. I've, I've written about it. <laughs> no. For the rest of the audience, give a give a give a, a brief uh, on the education, the, just the, the education, it's, American it's, education. It's, it's it's different. I mean, the issue why why don't why don't Americans get in STEM because the excitement isn't there, the motivation isn't there. Why don't the top students from our uh, from Duke and Harvard and so on uh, get into um, um, into tech because the investment bankers siphon off the best uh, you know people directly from the top. And they go and start engineering the financial system versus engineering solutions for uh, uh, society. Uh, why isn't, uh, aren't more regions like Silicon Valley? Because fear of failure and uh, uh, the mentorship networks and so on are lacking. It's a, it's a whole series of complex uh, discussions we can get into. Uh, no, I, I would, no one answer. I would just add uh, just one point. Um, in part of your this question uh, that, that, that you just posed here, you sort of blew by a point that I thought is quite important. You, you, you intimated correct me if I'm wrong, that um, uh, there are a lot of STEM workers here who can't find work. I thought you said that. OK, so, so that, that very much, um, I just want to be very clear with people, even though it's obvious. I want to connect the dots. I mean, Bruce uh, said this. Others have said this. There is a, you said something to the effect that there's a very large skill shortage. That doesn't sound like a very large skill shortage. Now, you may have been, that may be cyclical, you may be talking structural, but we need to learn a lot more before we, I say, fairly blithely go around saying there is a big skill shortage. I, I, would, I would agree with this. that. In fact, we, have, we haven't said there's a, a shortage, but I think we need to look at that more closely. And in fact, depending on what um, studies you read, some say that we're in fact producing more STEM degrees than we have jobs. But the, there is evidence that people are being diverted from STEM occupations into other fields. You mentioned finance. So that's something that needs to be studied more closely. And I think this is why we go back to the reason why we need a standing commission and why we made it that way in terms of a panel, the nonpartisan panel, because this is, again, this is the first layer of the data, the, uh, data that's available. We still need a lot more data from the BLS, NSF, all these different, and you could layer it all together and actually could test this for actual shortages. We tried to do it. We actually tried to push it, push the boundaries of what we can do, but we weren't able to do that. But I think what we were able to do is that I think that this commission could also, also for the interest for employers, is that you know, data is lagged. It takes at least a year to sift through. It mm -hmm. took us a year to clean up the government data. And Neil, if I could pick up yep. uh, be one of Vivek's points, isn't the best way to know what skills are lacking to let business, to just let business hire what skills they need? 
I mean, why, mm -hmm. why, what makes you think you can, re and this picks up a little bit on Jared's point, what makes you think you can really know all these things in a timely fashion from here in Washington with a group of experts, especially if they come out of the Labor Department? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, no, that's no, why we no, don't no, think that, this is the Labor Department. No, it's the Labor Department. <laughs> that's got to do with, and I know we had somebody here from the Chamber of Commerce, and I meant to, I, I wish you yeah. were up here to talk about these things. Um, their fear is that this commission would be dominated by the Labor Department, where there's an attitude to restrict, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to an attitude, you know, their, their fear is that it would be an attitude to restrict, and that's why they don't want, they've wanted to stay away from it. There yeah. is some ways that I know that, that there, there are ways around this that people are talking about, but anyway, but... Let, we need to have California and New York but, allowed to be allowed to set their own policies. But, but I wanted to ask you that, uh, Neil. Uh, That's why in this panel, for the first time, like what we looked at, what we, we suggested is that there should be a business research organization. Because when we went around talking to different businesses, you know, everyone's going to tell you, we need more skilled workers. There's a shortage, right? But then we're like, wait a minute. How do we assess that? We need something more objective. They um, always say that. Yeah. They, so we need something more objective to... So that's why we have the Labor Department, we have the NSF, then we have a business research organization. They can hash it out together looking at objective facts. So Absolutely. I think that's why we, we, we actually put their business research organization. You know, Iowa and Arizona should be allowed to close their doors if they want to do that. <laughs> Silicon Valley and New York should be allowed to uh, open their doors as widely as they want. And let's see who wins. Right. Here in the, in the middle... Hi, my name is Matthew Asad. I'm a Foreign Service Officer. I've issued H-1B visas, served out there in India, and I'm currently working for Congressman Peters for Michigan. My question is, and I really appreciate this study because it highlights some of the regional diversity within our country, and it suggests also the mismatch in labor markets that occurs within our internal market. Companies are willing to spend $10,000 to try to pay for workers to come from overseas, what I might suggest also as a policy remedy is to look at the internal relocation expenses that companies are willing to pay and the uh, hiring for jobs within the United States. Because if we can't get people to go to Silicon Valley, is it, is it easier to hire someone from overseas than it is to hire someone from Detroit, for instance? Your comments on internal labor market flexibility, government support for relocation expenses, how do we ensure that maybe that $10,000 that company is willing to spend on someone from overseas instead goes to someone from Atlanta. Thanks. I think it's a really mm. important issue you raised. Yeah, yeah. good question. I, I, I would just like to say I think that's a, that's a great question, an important issue. And one thing that makes that even more difficult to address in this economy is that a lot of people are underwater in their mortgages, and it's going to be even more difficult for them to pick up and move across country. So I think you raise a good point. I, th I think that's one of the root problems over here, frankly. And I guess the only other thing I'd add is I, I think we uh, there's been some agreement on the panel today that... Um, the H-1B program is uh, inappropriately used to put downward pressure on wages. I think if there were more of a labor market test and a wage floor, um, that would actually incentivize workers to come from other places to be more mobile, to try to boost the internal labor market. It's, it's really the, uh, the notion that I was describing before of letting market signals work and not trying to jam those signals with, with too much public policy. We have one last question in the back. Hi, my name is Phyllis Pinoza, and I'm from the Census. Uh, my question is whether or not, um, when we're looking at amending the program, if there's been discussion about having some kind of clause where there's like an equivalent compensation or protections of labor rights. I think the issues with the guest programs is that these questions are that people are evading appropriate compensation levels or people are putting workers at risk of exploitation. So when we're looking at the solution, if this is a very kind of band-aid um, to these problems. Are those part of the conversations, and is there evidence to support the need for that? Uh, I'll just quickly respond. Uh, yeah, I, I think there is uh, evidence to support the claims that we've made, uh, that I've been making on those issues, although a lot of it is, is pretty anecdotal. I, I, would, I would admit that. Um, but I think if you, if you look at this, I keep talking about Durbin Grassley only because it's kind of the, uh, you know, it, it's the bill that tries to deal with, with some of these problems. Um, you'll see that it does try to introduce a labor market test, a wage floor, and particularly in the context of your question, the potential for exploitation, break that, that lock, that linkage between the sponsoring employer. I mean, if, if the sponsoring employer controls your fate, and they are not all evil by any stretch of the imagination, most of them are ethical, perfectly law-abiding people, 
But there are, there are enough anecdotes to lead you to believe that that, and, and just logic to believe you, lead you to believe that that's problematic. You know, my view is that the more government uh, laws you pass, the more controls and, and labor market has this and that, uh, the more jobs you're going to create in Washington, D.C., and the less jobs you're going to have in the rest of America. Let the market do its magic. Take care of all these limits. Let workers come and work for companies and shift jobs if uh, they don't get paid enough. The market will equalize salaries on its own. Companies don't want to have to relocate foreigners from here and deal with all the cultural issues, with all the... The, you know, all the bureaucratic issues. They'd rather hire someone local if they can get that person. But right now, we're distorting it by every time uh, my friend Jared says something, it's yet another government law that is required. The stock more, market more, falls. More, more bureaucracy in, uh, <laughs> in D.C. We need less bureaucracy, less D.C., less workers in D.C., more in Silicon Valley, and that'll fix the economy. Our, our yeah. authors get the last word. Okay, I just want to address your question. There are a couple of um, protections currently built into the program already, and one is the prevailing wage. Um, in that employers are required to, to pay the prevailing wage for that occupation that's recognized in you know, national surveys. And then the other one is the fraud prevention. And their um, USCIS conducts unannounced site visits to these employers. They interview the workers, find out if they're actually doing the jobs they were hired to do, and if they're getting paid the prevailing wage. So basically, just to reiterate on Jill's point, yeah, there is already, it's already been built in in the program. And I guess some of the proposals are to make it increase so that, and I know from in, talking to employers, they told me that they had a big increase on site visits uh, this pa the last past couple years. Well, I, that wraps it up. I think we've had a, we've had a, a, a fun <laughs> debate, clearly. I mean, this wasn't a love fest up here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it sure was. But, but, it re no, but, it really, but it really exposed the issues in, in a very uh, articulate way on, on, on both sides, and, and all based on an excellent study, an excellent presentation. I think these folks deserve a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.